well, just to try to tune in a little bit this morning to some of the things that we you know, sing about, some of the things that we talk about and share and pray about. And, and I don't know about you, but when I hear a lot of the things and read a lot of the things that Jesus said, they're really inspiring to me. They're good stuff. Uh, I think about things like, um, I just jotted a few down. I am with you always. I love that Jesus said that. Now, I, I realize when I, when I say that, some people might, might think, well, I, there are times when I don't want Jesus around. But I love when Jesus says, I am with you always. I, I draw a lot of comfort from that. Uh, some of the things like this that he said, I don't call you servants. I call you my friends. And I'm thinking, when you really think about that, that the God of the universe calls me, calls you a friend, that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, I really dig it when Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. I didn't come to condemn, but to save. I, I like that. I like it when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I don't know about you, I'm a big fan of light. I like light. So that, that kind of is a cool thing for me to hear Jesus say. He also said, you'll have trouble in this world, but be encouraged. I've overcome the world. Ah, I like those things. When Jesus says those inspiring sorts of things, I don't know about you, but I'm like, yes, I like it. I embrace that. We can get excited about that. But then Jesus also says some other things. Like this. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And you can read that and think, um, Jesus, what, what about that good shepherd thing? What about you calling me your friend? What? It seems pretty harsh. It seems pretty harsh. Let's pause for just a minute and encourage you this way. Jot some things down that you want to remember. And then use the study guide. It's a tear-off on your program. You can just tear that off. It's a bookmark. Uh, it'll lead you into some scriptures that will relate back to what we're talking about today. There is a more detailed study guide in, uh, on, the, on the website. So go there if you want to kind of go a little bit deeper. But the main goal is for us to be in God's Word for ourselves. To not take anybody's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Open the book and read it for yourself and see how God speaks to you. So in this series... It's called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. We're looking at some of those difficult, harsh, I don't know what you would call them, maybe abrasive things that Jesus said, and we're going to try and figure out why did he say them. Um, these aren't the, the necessarily the inspirational things Jesus said. They're the hard things. We're going to look at them and, and say, all right, this is a hard saying, but what in there do I need to start living out, practicing, figuring out? in my own life. And so we want to do that. We want to dig deep. And we also have another component to this, and that is the, the home group component. If you're not in a home group especially, um, we want you to consider being in one because the home group component is going to look at the same stuff we're looking at in the, in the message series on Sundays. So you can go even deeper and in some different directions with a home group. Come on Wednesday night. All right. If you're not in one, do a test drive. Uh, do life better. Do life together. So uh, don't forget about that. Um, I always want to say this too. My family and I are in a home group and have been for a number of years now. We love it. It is a big, big part of, big, big part of our lives. So, so back to the topic at hand though. Let's wrestle with these harsh words I just read a minute ago. Um, the one I just read, the passage I just read a minute ago comes from the Gospel of Luke. Remember the Gospels are, are those accounts of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his teachings, his sayings. So Matthew was one of the writers of an account. Uh, Mark, Luke, and John were the other writers. Luke takes that same statement from Jesus and he, he writes it down a little bit different. He heard it differently. Uh, take a look at it, what, what Luke writes down. Jesus said, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. You see why this series is called Things I Wish Jesus Never Said? Because it's hard. These are harsh words. To really follow Jesus, you have to, have to hate your father, mother, your family. Hate's a very strong word, isn't it? 
Um, I, I think this last week, in the last week and a half, we have seen just how ugly hate can be. And, and this, this is even more difficult because, I mean, aren't we, if we choose to follow Jesus, supposed to stand against hate? And, and then not only that, we read here that we're supposed to hate our fathers and mothers and children. And, and it, it just seems so against everything that we are taught. So how do we understand this? Hate? How do we get it? There's a, a principle about reading Scripture that you need to learn if you haven't learned it already. Uh, we talk about it once in a while around here, but it's a very important key to unlocking passages of Scripture like this. So you see, most of the time when Jesus speaks, He is speaking in parables. He's telling stories. He is using sayings and metaphor to convey very deep messages. But if He's not speaking in terms of stories and parables, then He is speaking with a different voice and that's the prophetic voice. Sometimes Jesus talks like an Old Testament prophet. And, and when Old Testament prophets spoke, they, they weren't really concerned about the little nuances in what they were saying. They just wanted to paint a very bold picture to stir people's minds and their emotions. Uh, so, so when they spoke prophetically, when Jesus speaks prophetically like an Old Testament prophet, he is trying to shock us and make us say, what on earth is going on here? Why would Jesus, love in human form, tell us to hate? That's the whole concept, is to get our attention like an Old Testament prophet. Now, th this, this is called prophetic hyperbole. And what is hyperbole? Well, hyperbole is an intentional exaggeration in order to make a point. It's an exaggeration in order to evoke a reaction and evoke a strong feeling. And Jesus uses this prophetic hyperbole, this voice, uh, fairly regularly. One of the, probably the best example of this um, is this passage from Matthew. He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble or causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. That's prophetic hyperbole. He is not literally telling people to gouge out their eyes and cut off their hands, right? But the point that he's making is just as powerful. He's saying sin is that bad. It's that bad. It, it will lead you to hell. And, it, and, and, and to give up certain habits, certain patterns, certain sins in our lives will feel like gouging out an eye or cutting off our own hand it will hurt that bad but it will be way 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 better than going to hell I mean, so that's the point of that particular passage so when we see jesus tell us that we have to hate the people we love the most he's using prophetic hyperbole to get our attention He's not literally telling us to hate anybody. The translation I'm using today, I think, helps this to get, become a little bit clearer because in the translation I'm using today, there are two words in there that help us to get our brains around this. And the two words are by comparison. By comparison. Jesus says that if you want to be his disciple, you have to, by comparison, hate everyone else. Um, how about I illustrate this? So... I love my wife. I love my, she's on the keyboard here just a little bit ago. In case you don't know, that's my wife, Janet. Um, but I, I love my wife. I also love Pastor Ben. Now, you don't know who Pastor Ben is, right? He's our, our Carl Junction pastor and one of my oldest friends, right? I love my wife. I love Pastor Ben. But I love them very differently. I love my wife a lot. She's not in the room right now, so you know, I, I, I wish you could hear this. She'll be here next service. I love my wife. But by comparison, I, I love her so much more than I love Pastor Ben, right? And that better be obvious, that by comparison, do I love Pastor Ben? Absolutely. Again, one of my oldest friends, one of my best friends, I love Pastor Ben. But by comparison, I love my wife so much more. You get it. You get it. Jesus was comparing our love of earthly things, our love of earthly relationships 
to how we love God. And what he's getting at is, by comparison, our love for God should not compare. So, so that's the main point he's getting at. The question that we have to look at in this passage where it really begins to get personal and difficult this question that kind of sticks out of this passage is something like this. How are you really living when it comes to this passage? Do you live as if you love God more than anything else or anybody else in this world? Can you say honestly that you love God more than the stuff you own? But, but, but you, you can say that. How are you living it? Because saying it and living it are two different things. Um... Do you love God more than your comfort? Do you love God more than your career? Do you love God more than you love your political party? Do you love God above your family? Do you love God above your children? Do you love God more than you love yourself? By comparison, do you love God more than anything and everybody else? If you don't, what does Jesus say here in the Scripture? if you love your mom, dad, spouse, kids more than you love God, Jesus is saying, you're not worthy of me. You're not worthy to follow me. I am not worthy to follow him. Harsh words. I can put this in the category of things I wish Jesus never said. Could he have not used the word hate? I think we sort of know that we should love God more than anything else. But if you're honest, if you're like me, sometimes I don't. And, and so I have to ask the question, why don't we? Why don't we? What's the problem? And, and as a pastor, I'm always trying to, to think about and, and to uh, pray about and to talk about how do we all become more deeply committed in our faith? How do, we, how, do, how do you experience more happiness and joy because you're more deeply connected to Christ? And, and then you know, I, I strive to I think about those things and I, I work on those things and I have some of these low moments once in a while and I struggle and I wonder and questions pop into my head like, why don't you serve more? Why don't you give more? Why don't you care about your community more? Why don't you pray more? Why, why don't you share your faith more? Why don't, you, why don't you avoid some of the traps that are so clearly there? Why do you still struggle? Some of you still struggle to get along just in basic relationships. Why are some of you clinging so tightly to your possessions? I mean, the list could go on and on, and I, and I can get pretty down about that sometimes and wonder, but what I've realized is that all those things I just listed, I mean, they're all external things. Those things are simply symptoms that we don't quite understand what we have in Jesus Christ. That we don't quite understand. That those are symptoms that something else is not where it needs to be. What is that something? I think Paul was trying to explain this to some Christians. And he, he begins to tell them a little bit, and then he begins to tell them about a prayer that he prays for them. And I love these sorts of things. So when Paul is talking about his prayers... So take a look at this. This is Ephesians chapter 3. He says, My response is to get down on my knees. He's, he's praying. Get down on my knees before the Father, the Creator of everything in heaven and earth. So picture what he's doing. He's getting down on his knees and praying. And as I pray, I ask him to strengthen you. So he's talking to these people, you know, writing to the, these, these people in, in his church. I, I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit. Not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that, that with both feet planted firmly on love, that you'll be able to take in with all followers of Jesus the extravagant dimension of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. Plumb its depths. Rise to its heights. Live full lives, full in the fullness of God. I, I love it when Paul didn't know who I was. He had no idea who, who I, who, you know, when he was praying this prayer. And, but he prayed for me. And he prayed for you. That you would stand firmly in love. And that you would know the, the breadth and depth and length of the love of Jesus Christ. That's what he prayed for us. 
the fullness of God, that we would know would be full, filled to the fullness of God. And that, that leads to another question. What is the fullness of God? Um, maybe this is a clue. Scripture says this, whoever does not love does not know God because God, what? Is love. God is love. So Paul's prayer is that we would be filled with the fullness of of God, that means to be completely filled with love. So, that leads to another question. Do you really know how much God loves you? I, you know, I think it's kind of hard to understand, really. You see, I think we kind of know how much God loves us, and so we kind of follow Jesus. We kind of know so we kind of follow it. So Paul is dealing with our inside heart issue on this passage because lots of us don't understand internally what we have in Jesus Christ. And, and we don't fully get it in our, our hearts, in our souls, because in order to get it, we've got to take a risk. We've got to be vulnerable. Here's another verse about God's love in Scripture that it's hard for us to fathom. Um, it's found in John chapter 15. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Uh, let's leave that up there, that passage. Think about what that means. H how much do you think the Father loves the Son? God the Father loving God the Son. H how much? Do you, do, I think it's a lot. I mean, as, as God the Father watches Jesus enter the world, as God the Father sees Jesus teach and interact as God the Father sees Jesus crucified and resurrected. How much does the Father love the Son? Probably more than we can imagine. And, and Jesus says, that is how much I love you. As much as the Father loves the Son. That in, shouldn't this passage say something different though? Shouldn't it say uh, in, in John here, as the Father loved me, I love you 50% of that. Because that'd still be a lot. Or as, as much as the Father loved the Son, I love you 33% of that, or 10% of that, and that'd be a lot. I mean, but no, that's not what he said. He said, I love you as much as the Father loves the Son. And this is hard for some of us here today to embrace. Really, God? As much as the Father loved the Son, you love me that much? And the answer is yes, he does. Understand it here in your head and then embrace it here in the heart. That's how we get there. That's the end goal. He, wait, he loves me um, even if? Oh yeah, even if. E, oh wait, let's list some of the even ifs. He loves me even if I'm disobedient? Yeah, he, he loves you as the Father loves the Son even when you're disobedient. Wait, wait, even, even when I'm selfish? Yep. Even when I'm hateful and ugly? Yeah, he loves you. He, he loves me even when I love my wife and kids more than I love him? Yep, even when you get that part wrong, he loves you. You see, when we begin to understand that and accept that, then everything in the world begins to change around us, or how we perceive it anyway. And the point of today's message is not that we should love God. I mean, that's what the passage said, you know. Hey, if you love anybody more than God, you're not worthy to follow me. But that's not the point of the message today. The point of the message is not us loving God. The point of the message today is that God loves you. When Jesus says, if you want to be a follower of mine, hate your father, mother, your sister, brother, does he mean it literally? You need to be able to answer that quickly. The answer is no doesn't mean he wants you to hate anybody in this life. It does mean that he wants you to care about, or, or that it means that he cares about the same things that you care about. And he cares more than we can possibly imagine. What, what does this look like? What, is it, what, what does love feel like? Us being loved by God and us loving God back, what, what does that feel like? Um, my kids are growing up really fast, so you know we have these these uh, human examples. My kids are growing up really, really fast. Zoe's going to be a senior in high school. Is a senior. They've started, you know, and Abby is just starting middle school, and these are all big transitions and, and big times in their lives. And so my oldest daughter, 
as a, as a senior here in Joplin in high school, um, what we see as parents is she's creating her own life now. And, you know, you guys who have, have kids that have gone through this, you know, I mean, they seem to need you as parents less and less and less. And that's kind of a healthy thing that you want to see them get independent, but it can also hurt. It's natural. Um, we toured a couple colleges with Zoe over the summer. Wow. So we just see that, you know, that independence coming. And some parents hate that. Some parents celebrate that. I'm proud of my kids. Um, and, and I know that I love them deeper than they could possibly realize. Do you guys understand what I'm talking about as parents, grandparents, that you love your kids deeper than they could ever possibly know? Um, and they're going to get to a point in their life where they, they just don't include us in their daily lives as parents. We know that's coming. And that is, of course, until they need something. They need help with uh, their taxes or they need help with their car or home repair or understanding their jobs or whatever it might be, insurance. You know, I hope my kids never hate me, but every parent wonders if their kids care. Every parent hopes that their kids have some glimpse of the love the parent has for them. And I think every parent hopes that their kids reflect some of that love back, at least once in a while. You ever wonder that as a parent? Do my kids care? Do they love me? My mom will call me fairly regularly and say, Aaron, I need you to come home. I need to spend some time with you. And you know what she's doing? She's saying, I just need to know. I need to see that you care. I need to see that you love me. I, my mom has poured her life into me, and she wants to know that I, I care. My dad does the same thing. He'll say, hey, I just haven't seen you in a while. It's time. You know, I just want to know, do, do you care about the love that I've given to you? Now, last Wednesday, Zoe texted me. Um, last Wednesday morning, she texted me, Dad, my sink is stopped up. Oh, joy. So uh, I went home at noon uh, on my lunch break, and I took a look, and the sink in her bathroom literally was filled up to the top. It was right up, you know. It's like she had, whatever she was doing, she's like, well, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing because the sink is clogged. So it was well, all the way up to the top. So I got the zip strip. You know what a zip strip is? If you don't know what a zip strip is, you need to get one. These are handy things, you know. So you stick that down in the, in the hole, and you pull out whatever is in there. But the zip strip wasn't long enough to reach whatever was clogging it, so you know what that means. Those of you who have done this before, means you've got to pull everything out from under the cabinet, and you've got to disassemble the, the, the trap down there. Oh, one of my favorite things. I, you know, one of the most dangerous parts of this whole journey for me was seeing what is underneath the cabinet that my, all these girl things that my daughter has underneath there, and pulling all that out. So I get it all that out, get my bucket, get some rags. I've done this many times before, and I disassemble all of that, and it was, a, it was nasty. I took a picture. Do you want to see it? Here it is. There it is. It was like, what is that? I don't even, okay, take it down. That's gross. Yeah. So I'm carrying this bucket out of her bathroom, and she comes home, and I, I just had to show her. I said, hey, Zoe, you know, I wasn't mad at her or anything. I said, hey, Zoe, you got to see what I pulled out of, your, out of your drain. I love making my kids gag. That is like... <laughs> One of, the, one of the best things. And so I, I got all that taken care of and cleaned everything up, and she was laying on the couch, and I walked by, and she's like, Dad, thank you. I love you. Wow. Some of that, just a little glimpse of love reflected back. For doing something, I mean, and, and that's, why, that's why you do that sort of thing. You love. You clean out a disgusting drain because you love. Uh, she, uh, I asked her permission if I could share um, the Father's Day card that she, she gave me this, this last year. She, here's what she wrote. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for being there for me, even when I'm ranting about nonsense. I can think of this in terms of, of our relationship with God, your relationship with God. Have you ever told God something like this? I don't know. Um, Thank you for being there for me when I'm ranting about nonsense. Thank you for giving me wisdom. Thank you for being goofy and weird. Thank you for teaching me the difference between being weird and being a weirdo. I, I, tell, my kids, I, I tell my kids the O makes all the difference. Thank you for being my lunch buddy 
editor, role model, and my biggest fan. I love you, Zoe. That's a keeper, isn't it? I mean, do you know what it's like that you are loved by your child? When you're a parent, you pour everything into your kids. You would do anything for them. There isn't anything that I wouldn't give my kids if it, you know, as long as it was the right thing and I could do it. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we grow up loving our parents, most of us, because they take care of us, they nurture us, they, they love us. We can't help but love them back. But when your child reflects that kind of love back at you, man, it fills your heart with joy. I can't help but wonder what God does when, when, we, when we reflect love back at him. I mean, he is love, right? God is love. We just read that. When God has love reflected back at him, I, I don't know what that does to the heart of God, but I bring, you know, we know that God experiences joy. We know that God experiences happiness. And, and maybe that's what happens when we reflect that, God, that love back. And, and I think it just makes, us lo- makes him love us more. Now, there's one thing, I've got to talk about this harsh say- saying of Jesus. You know, some people might read this and wonder. And in fact, I think a lot of people in their faith journey have wondered this at some point in passages like this. You, you know, God, you want me to love you more than my wife and kids? God, are you needy? Are you insecure? Is God so starved for attention that, that he wants to lay a guilt trip on us uh, to, to love him more than anything else? And I, I think it's a logical question. Like I said, it's a question a lot of people in their faith journeys at some point ask. And, and here's how I'd address that. Um, it's an instance in, in Jesus' life. So one day he's teaching. Uh, he's teaching about natural stuff that we are concerned about. And um, the basics, he goes through a list of things that we need, clothing, food, shelter, and, and he tells us, don't worry about those things. Here's what he says. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, and what will we drink, and what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. I mean, He's saying, yeah, the, the stuff that you need, the stuff you're concerned about is important, but if you seek God above all of that stuff, then those things will take care of themselves. And, and what I know from firsthand experience is this, that the more I love God, the more I love my mom and my dad and my wife and my kids and you the more I love God, the more I'm able to love my enemies, people I don't understand, people who are difficult. The more I love God, the more everything else begins to make sense. Loving God first and most helps me to love others best. This isn't about God being insecure, needing my love. God is not needy. God simply knows that when we love him first and most, we're able to love everyone else best. God does not want you to hate your father or mother. He simply wants us to love him first. And the expectation is that when we love God and we put him first in our lives, all that other stuff falls into place. And that's what Jesus means when he says to those who who lose their life for God, find their lives. To find the life you're looking for, Jesus simply says, come follow me. Come. And it's in the following that we discover life. Following Jesus is worth it. Yeah, some things you've got to leave behind, but other things you discover for the very first time. It requires us to understand. Loving God requires us to understand with our minds and then to embrace our hearts and with our souls and maybe it's time to do that in a new way for you or maybe for the first time maybe it's time to take that step the message today isn't about us learning to love God partly it is more than anything it's about us learning the full meaning that God loves you 
powerful stuff. And for today, that's the good news. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we're all in different places in understanding this journey of faith. But I pray that when we encounter these difficult passages, things that you said that kind of, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of us have read them and just ignored them completely because they were so strange. Help us to be people that dig deep. Help us to be people that understand with our heads and with our hearts. As a part of this prayer, I want to just pray what, what Paul said. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Jesus, we pray Paul's prayer together in your name. Help us to get it. Amen.